Hi, welcome to Blogging Heads TV. This is Culturally Determined on Blogging Heads. Uh, my name is Arya Cohen-Wade. I'm your host today. And my guest is uh, Katie Waldman. Uh, Katie, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Katie. Um, I work at Slate. I am the words correspondent. So I cover literature, language, books, culture. Uh, yeah, so we have- oh, man, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> well, well, thanks so much for coming on. We have a bunch of different topics today. Uh, we're gonna be covering um, uh, Brian Williams and Jon Stewart. Uh, we're gonna be talking about Harper Lee and her uh, newly rediscovered uh, lost novel and whether it should be released or not. And then we're also gonna talk about Serial a little bit. And we're probably gonna close with talking about uh, language policing and whether certain words or phrases are kosher or not. Uh, so let's let's start with Brian Williams and, and John Stewart. So these things kind of came out coincidentally uh, the same night. Uh, and, uh, you know, Stewart is there, the way it's kind of playing out is like Stewart is leaving at the top of his game and Williams is like, you know, been brought low by his by his lie. So so what do you think about this? Um, yeah, I mean, I do think just from like a structural perspective, it's like a really interesting thing. You have this one guy slinking off in disgrace and um, Stuart is in triumph. Um, but I was just reading this really interesting piece actually on Slate that argued that um, that John Stewart's comedy sort of showed the ways that um, Brian Williams's form of commentary and news were outdated or was outdated. Mm -hmm. And that like the line was already sort of blurring between comedy and uh, straight up anchor anchoring. Um, and <laughs> that, you know, maybe this is actually a good, this like sort of artificial pairing um, points to a actual thematic pairing between the end of these two eras. Yeah, was that, was that was that the John Swansburg? Um, piece. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I just read that too. Yeah, that was interesting. So yeah, I think it's it's not, he makes a good point. So it's not just a, you know, it's a temporal coincidence that these two things are happening, but these, but Williams and Stewart are linked, you know, they did a bunch of different interviews. And I think Williams even told his story that was discredited on The Daily Show one time, which is kind of, kind of strange. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, so I think, you know, the, I think there, you know, the links go, go actually pretty deep because, you know, so the, the figure of the anchor is this kind of weird, you know, weird, creation of like the mid-century tv landscape and like walter cronkite is the is the person who gets mentioned in these conversations all the time like he was the last kind of person who everyone agreed had moral authority when he came out against vietnam it like marked a real a real change in the country um but that figure doesn't exist anymore and it's been brought down by the rise of cable news the rise of the internet the self-inflicted wounds that figures like dan rather and now brian williams did to themselves um but you know what kind of what these two things kind of made me think was that, you know, like John Stewart kind of like he kind of took the the moral authority that Walter Cronkite once had. And mm -hmm. like like John Stewart does have some moral authority in America. And I don't think you could say Brian Williams ever did have moral authority. And it's not because he like went on 30 Rock. It's just because like, you know, he just reads the news and maybe he interviews yeah. fam famous people sometimes. But like you never really want to like know what Brian Williams thinks about something. Like he doesn't have an interesting, I mean, he's, he's a funny guy. And when he appeared on the daily show and on 30 rock, he's obviously smart and can make fun of himself and plays with this, this role that he has, but you know, he doesn't, he doesn't have moral authority. Yeah, that's true. And, and that has sort of been raised as a mitigating circumstance, like, oh, you know, how much, I mean, I guess, obviously he presents himself as a trustworthy source. And if that is sort of your claim to fame, like you go on TV in order to be the font of accurate and, you know, compelling news, and then you're not telling the truth like that, you sort of, you've cut yourself off at the at the source. But, right. um, but I also think that there's something there's something kind of humane about Jon Stewart's satire, which is which is strange. I mean, like he is um, sending up hypocrisy um, and he's sometimes pretty brutal. But I almost wonder whether, you know, Brian Williams, this scandal um, treated on The Daily Show would be like a softer treatment than what he's getting just on Twitter and in the press right now. Mm -hmm. Like, I just... I wonder, I mean, how do you feel about the way people have really gone after Brian Williams? Because on one hand, there's no excuse for that kind of falsehood, but it also seems so human to to exaggerate and to want to win people over and like tell a larger than life story. 
Yeah, I, yeah, those are great points. I was actually pretty surprised that this story snowballed so much when it when it first came out last mm-hmm. week. I kind of it was kind of I thought it would be like a who cares kind of story. And actually, my, my, my boss, Robert Wright, published a piece today in the New Republic about the kind of the psychology of, of conflated memories and how, you know, what he did was a very kind of human error. And of, of course, there's a lot, multiple people have commented on how strange it is that someone who is at the pinnacle of his, you know, profession would still would feel the need to embellish stories to make himself seem better. It's not like he's angling for a different job or something. So there is something kind of sa- sadly human about, about that aspect uh, to it as well. Yeah. Um, and essentially, I mean, it makes you realize that that sort of desire for even more um, fame and and sort of ego bodies or whatever, um, it just, it's an addiction. It's like the more you have, the more you want. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's like a suspicion that most people working online have anyway because of Twitter and just sort of like the Ouroboros um cycle of of tweeting more and then getting more replies and it keeps going on but to to see it sort of lay low this titan of of news uh, it was i mean i thought it was i'm not surprised that people picked up on the story even if i am surprised by how um how hard a time they're giving him actually yeah i guess the other thing that kind of surprised me about it i mean obviously there's kind of a shot in freud when any person who's you know high up you know is is taken down but it's not like this was uh, like maybe maybe some conservatives thought that Brian Williams was, you know, a closet liberal and you know skewed the news against them. But it's not like, you know, it, this, it, he's not like um, a Rachel Maddow kind of kind of figure or someone who's right. instantly polarizing like he pretty much everyone thought he played it down the middle and didn't have much of a of a political slant. And maybe people uh, on the other side of the aisle would, would disagree with that. But, you know, so there were it didn't seem like there were a bunch of people like with waiting with their knives out, just ready for Brian Williams to be taken down so they could all plunge it into his back. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that, that kind of struck me as, as strange also. But, you know, I was thinking about, you know, the the figure of like the anchor and it seems like the anchor. So so Williams, like he was kind of a postmodern anchor because he kind of played with the persona uh, like he hosted mm-hmm. Saturday Night Live once. He played himself on yeah. 30 Rock, as I said, and like, you know. So the figure of the anchor has kind of been like a a, a punchline since the Mary Tyler Moore show and um, with with Ted sure, Baxter. Like anchor man. <laughs> yeah, an anchor an, yeah. anchor man. You know, came out actually the first Anchorman movie may have came out about the same time that Brian Williams took over, um, mm-hmm. uh, hosting the the nightly news. And yeah, so I mean, the the figure it's kind of become a figure of fun and and um, mm-hmm. you know some people were kind of saying that Williams, you know, and courting uh publicity and always and trying to seem like a you know witty guy who could crack jokes with john stewart kind of like brought this upon himself but you know the the uh, walter cronkite authority figure like we're never going to get that back that was kind of a weird thing that happened because of the fact there were only there were only three tv channels and and other things Mm -hmm. about the media of that time but um you know the authority figure like that's that's never going to come back no matter what, what happens to brian williams but kind of comparing this with john stewart what it made me think was like, okay, so Lester Holt is probably going to take over for mm-hmm. for Brian Williams, and you know Lester Holt seems like a perfectly acceptable replacement. He actually even kind of looks a little bit like Brian Williams. I was I was thinking about it today. You know, he, like they both look like anchors. You know, they're tall guys and they have yeah. strong jaws and uh, you know good hair. And um, so NBC News, you know, the nightly news is not going to be any different with Lester Holt hosting it as with right. Brian Williams hosting it. But the Daily Show is going to be different if it continues on with a different host. Uh, Stuart, if you read anything about The Daily Show, Stuart was intimately involved in every episode and he like rewrote the scripts every night. Um, Mm -hmm. And whoever takes over, um, it's gonna be a very different show. So (laughs) Jon Stewart is a much more important figure in the world of comedy than than Brian Williams is in the world of news or politics. Well, also because the world of comedy is so much more contingent on personality than ideally. I mean, I know that we were talking about how Brian Williams was blurring this line a little bit, but ideally the world of objective news delivery is going to be less um, rooted in the pre- peculiar quirks of the of the anchorman than, than the Daily Show. Um, right, right. So being, so being I, objective I, means that if everyone is, is objective, then you know, subbing one person out for the, the the another objective objective person isn't a big deal either way. Right, right. And I've heard arguments that you know the Daily Show it has served its noble purpose. It's time for it to gracefully retire. You know the the 
um, offshoots of Jon Stewart, uh, Colbert, and and everyone. I don't know everyone who's become famous through The Daily Show. They have continued um, sort of that project past what it itself was able to accomplish, and sort of like logically extended the proposition. And now those those offshoots are doing a better job than The Daily Show. So you know maybe it should just be put to bed. I'm not sure. I'm not a religious watcher of The Daily Show, so I can't really speak to, you know, its um, persisting value or not. But I have heard those arguments for what it's worth. Yeah, I, I have not watched in, in recent years. Also, I, I no longer have cable TV. So that's that's part of the reason I would need to, you know, seek seek it out uh, to see it. I mean, right. the clips circulated online. They were, they were good. But, you know, mm -hmm. what that made me think was that, um, you know, Stewart wasn't as good in the Obama era as he was in the Bush era. Sure. And like there's I think there's a reason for that beyond just the fact that Stewart is obviously a liberal and agrees more with Obama yeah. than he does with Bush, which is like, you know, life under a lot of the Bush administration was like absurd and the media mm -hmm. like was playing it straight. And then Stewart right. was the, like one of the few people, Stewart and Colbert were one of the, like they were pointing out that like, oh, this was bullshit. Like, you know, a lot of this wasn't true. And the media like has a very hard time. It's funny that this is about lying because, um, you know, the media, when the, when the, when the media calls that a politician, it's usually for something that does not have political, actual political valence. It's mm -hmm. like a, a gaffe or a misstatement or a flip flop because then the media, because then journalists don't have to say one side is right. The other side is wrong. They just are saying like, you violated this neutral principle. Like you shouldn't, flip flop, you shouldn't tell a lie, you shouldn't, you know, say something offensive. So those are the kind of scandals that, that gain currency. But because the media is never going to say the Republicans are lying about this, even yeah. though there are a lot of things that the Republicans, especially during the Bush administration, you know, were lying about. And so Stewart and, and Colbert's speech at the correspondence dinner, like that was, those were like, that was especially was like a huge, you know, cultural moment of, of, of Colbert, you know, calling out Bush basically to his face. And it did seem mm -hmm. like that kind of was a change. And so, like, you know, obviously, I'm as liberal. I think um, Obama is better than Bush, but you know, the the targets weren't as rich, you know, in in, yeah. in recent years. And it became more like kind of a media. They did more stuff just making fun of cable news, which is inherently absurd, than than actually taking on, you know, the the uh, political power. Right, I agree, and I think that sort of the John Stewart um, vein of commentary comes out of such a deep disenchantment like there's so much puncturing there's so much um absurdity um and there's there's a little bit too much i mean obviously there are plenty of things going wrong with the obama administration but that sort of burn it all to the ground uh let's just you know throw our hands up and mock everything that i mean that's uh, that feels a little bit too disillusioned for the particular moment we're in right now uh, to me Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah, I mean, Stuart, I, I don't think Stuart was a kind of everything sucks. Everyone is is awful kind of guy or like taking on everyone. Like, I mean, you know, so Charlie Hebdo was, has obviously been in the news. They seem kind of like mm -hmm. they would take on anyone and they yeah. they would they would offend anyone. And it didn't, you know, people in power, or people out of power, like they were they there. It was kind of the South Park, like we'll just make fun of anyone thing. And, and that wasn't really the Daily Show's spirit it wasn't kind of like a nihilist kind of comedy um like you could tell that stewart really like cared about this stuff and mm -hmm. um and that, that you know that's what kind of fueled fueled the satire it wasn't it wasn't just like let's 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 tear it all down and shit on everyone sure but i mean still the mode is snark it's it's i mean just the fact that this venue was a comedy venue and the the mode of commentary was mockery and satire like that sort of belongs to a particular political dynamic that, you mm -hmm. know, again, like a different, a different mode of commentary would be sort of more straight up news, like the Brian Williams model. So, but yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. There is definitely, the, there's, there's a soul within that, within that um, criticism, definitely. Yeah. That's why I think Stuart, show. Stuart really did, does and did have moral authority because, you know, he wasn't just, going for the joke no matter what um you know he like he you know told it like he saw it and like he didn't bullshit and so much of like what appears on cable news and what you know if you're if you're doing the nightly news every night like some of what you're saying is bullshit 
and right. um, and like Williams kind of played with that persona, but um, mm-hmm. you know, it, only like the satirist can <laughs> can accurately call out call out bullshit. Yeah. And you know, the, and the, the brilliance of the Daily Show was that it used the TV news format to um, you know to mock mock TV news. Sure. Okay. Do you have anything else on uh, you want to talk about with Brian Williams or John Stewart or? satire yeah, i mean that that seems to get a lot of the terrain covered so i'm, I'm not okay why don't we why don't we that. move on to some, a more innocent time um Al, you know what is it mississippi or alabama actually it's alabama right i'm sorry where where are you going oh, where are you I'm taking go, I'm us going to Har- i'm going to harper lee's uh ah uh, yes harper alabama, lee's alabama alabama mm-hmm. okay so Montgomery. um yeah so so uh news broke last week that um there that uh harper um the publishing house will be um mm-hmm. publishing a kind of prequel to um to kill a mockingbird by harper lee um and this kind of shocked everyone and very quickly thereafter the story became weird and no longer seems like something we can all be happy about and you you wrote about this so can you uh, talk more about this yes sure so uh, it did the story did take a ghoulish turn. Initially, everyone was very excited. Um, But in the past, I guess, you know, five to eight years, there have been a lot of concerns raised about um, the extent to which Harper Lee has recovered from a stroke that she had in 2007 and how much um, how much she's still sort of with it. Um, And uh, she's had this very protective lawyer um, through through whom everything that we've heard from Harper Lee has been filtered. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's, you know, been famously quiet and, and um, have, has tried to evade the spotlight. And it just, it seems like strange timing that all of a sudden having sat on this manuscript, this early manuscript that is unedited that she initially didn't want to publish, you know, for 60 years now, just as her older sister, who is 103, she was 103, just as she dies. Um, and it seems like another defense has come down uh, between Harper Lee and the world. Um, she decides to release this prequel. It just, um, it struck a lot of people as a strange coincidence and not an entirely um, rosy, rosy one. So. Um, a lot of people have been wondering whether Harper Lee actually wants this manuscript published. Right. And so they came out with a second statement that was, you know, through the, through the lawyer, once again, whose name is possibly Tanya, though spelled with a J. Um, mm-hmm. And it had, as you noted in your piece on Slate about this, it was, had like a grammatical error in it. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the quote from Harper Lee. And so it seems kind of weird. And so it seems possible that like, Harper Lee is, you know, is too old and maybe her mental faculties are not um, up to the standard that she could actually consent to have this thing published and the meddling lawyer, you know, found it and decided to cash out. So that's kind of like the darkest interpretation. And so you, you wrote a piece at Slate arguing that, um, that Harper should cancel the, the publication plans. Yeah. And if only because the, um, the publishing house seems to have such a tenuous grip on what is actually going on. Like there was this really damning, I thought, interview in Vulture uh, with one of the Harper's publicists and editors who said, oh, you know, I'm not sure if if the document has been edited. I don't really know what we are, um, what process we're putting this these words through. And he just, he didn't seem to have any direct contact, or actually I know because I talked to a publicist at Harper, um, that they have had no direct contact with the author. Um, and yeah, so this, just, this was her, this was her yeah. editor, that, that interview of Vulture, you know, the, the mm-hmm. purported editor who I guess hasn't done any work really. Right. <laughs> um, because and didn't there's, even there's only really know where the book was, yeah. Right. Um, and it just, you know, given what we know about the life that she has built for herself out of the public eye, um, it seems that there's really no way that we can be sure that she wants this book published unless she releases a statement that is not through her lawyer and not through this bungling publisher. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, you know, if she comes out, if she feels like that's the price that she wants to pay, she suddenly wants to get back into the limelight. That's one thing, but I can't imagine that she actually would. And it seems like a huge ask to force her to do that. Um, just because the the rollout of this new novel has been botched 
botched so spectacularly. Right. So you th so you think it'd be better to just hold everything until Harper Lee eventually passes away? Yeah, and I know that sounds ghoulish, um, but yeah, I I I think that there's sort of a turning point when an author dies, and you know, Virgil didn't want the Aeneid published, and Kafka didn't want his work published, but you know, um, I, we're the better for having that literature with us. Um, right. I didn't but, know. I didn't you know, know that about 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 the Aeneid. Um, oh yeah, he he wanted it burnt. Um, luckily, luckily, his friends were were not amenable to that dying request. <laughs> right, and 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 famously, um, what's the guy's name? Max Broad. Is that Max is that Broad? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was the guy who was Kafka's friend, and Kafka gave everything to him in a suitcase or something, and um, mm -hmm. and said burn it. And Broad escaped um, before uh, the Holocaust and saved you know all these great works of literature. Um, so that was that was kind of so I kind of dis disagreed with your piece of slate. And that was kind of the angle. That I disagreed about. So, I mean, it's it's difficult because you know Harper Lee has like, you know, been in seclusion more or less for like half a century, and she only wrote this mm -hmm. one book, and it's like an American classic, and every kid reads it in, you know, like ninth grade. I think I think I read it in ninth grade, um, and you know, so if there's a new one, you know, I think it, it should be published at some point. But sure. Um, you know, I, I like, okay, let's say that, um, so, you know, Harper Lee, if we think she is of sound mind, like, she could have at some point, like, so this novel was, like, locked in a bank vault or something weird like that. You know, if she, like, wanted every copy of this novel of the manuscript to be destroyed, like, she could have done that at some point in her life. And, mm -hmm. and, and she didn't. And now it's, you know, we're not sure whether she actually wants this published or not. Um, but you know, Harper Lee is very old and, and her sister, like you said, lived to be 103. So it's possible that Harper Lee may live for another 15 or 20 years. Um, and like, I don't know. I just, I just feel like literature, like, you know, it's owed to literature that we like get this out sooner. And if she obviously was like, so if, if like Harper Lee had like barricaded herself in her house and would say like I am not releasing this. <laughs> I'm not releasing this novel. Yeah. Like, like we should not like right. storm her house and like take it from her so that everyone could read it. But like she, she either like is enthusiastically on board or is like not doesn't have the mental faculties to like oppose it at this point. And she's gonna die at some point in the next two decades. Um, okay. So what what's what's your rush though? I mean, like why why now as opposed to in fifteen years? Well, I mean, let's say it does take twenty more years. There are people who read To Kill a Mockingbird when it came out who will be dead. You know, <laughs> I mean, it came out like right. near, like 50 years ago or more. So, you know, yeah. there are people who maybe want to read the sequel who will not live if, if Harper Lee lives as long as her sister lived. Yeah, and I guess that should be part of the calculus. But I do think that the person who put the words on the page, like their wishes do probably count more than the contemporary reading audience mm -hmm. while, while that person is alive. I don't know. I guess there's just different ways of making that. Um, estimation it sort of it seems like it depends person to person what they'll decide but yeah no I, I, it's tricky I, I think also my response is a little bit colored by the suspicion that maybe this is not her best work otherwise she would maybe send it out into the world with her blessing or she would have done it earlier mm -hmm. we know that this was something that she was working on as a young untested writer that her editor read it and said i don't think this is the book that you want to write i think you want to use this character but bring it back to childhood mm -hmm. um and i just you know i i don't see this prequel I, and i you know it would be great to be proven wrong and there's a good chance that i would be um but I don't see this as something that will burnish her reputation so much as qualify it, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I'd, I'd like to at least honor what seemed to be, th honor the decision that seems most consistent with the way that Harper Lee has lived her life so far um, for as long as she's alive. And then I know it sounds ghoulish, as I said, then, you know, I think the, the floodgates open. Okay, so okay, so I, I I think when thinking about this, I was thinking about some other kind of like both hypotheticals and things that actually happened. So one thing mm -hmm. that actually did happen was um, Nabokov's final novel in progress called The Original of Laura, 
Um, yes. He wrote things on note cards and he was like dying as he was writing this. And mm-hmm. um, he he didn't finish it. And the note cards got locked away in a safe. And I believe he told either his wife, uh, Vera, or his son, Dimitri, uh, burn it. And mm-hmm. and it was never burned. And actually, there was a long, um, it was actually in Slate. Uh, Ron Rosenbaum wrote a series of articles yep. urging the publication of this and that that'd be yeah. saved. And so I actually, I have it here. You can't see this, but I'm holding it up to the camera. Uh, it was published okay. like in 2009 or 2010. And they published mm-hmm. in a very unusual way um, by showing the um, the actual note cards that Nabokov wrote on. And they were actually like, um, you could actually like punch them out of the book if you were like a total weirdo and wanted to do that so that you could like arrange mm-hmm. the novel as you thought maybe it should be. Huh. Yeah. And so it's not very good. Um, I mean, it's barely it's barely a novel. It's barely a short story. Like, there's not much there. It's a thick book, but it's because the uh, the pages are so thick because there are these you know fake cards that you can punch out. So mm-hmm. you know, I'm I'm a big Nabokov fan, and I would you know eagerly anticipated this. I read it. I was disappointed. There are parts of it that um, were interesting, and I still remember you know five or more years later. But just a couple scenes, really, or descriptions. Um, so it's it's real. It's just a fragment. Um, but mm-hmm. like, I'm like glad it exists, and I'm glad that. Sure. Dmitry Nabokov did not burn it, but like Nabokov wanted it burned, and he was like too ill at the end of his life to have it burned. Yeah. So like. But but then again, it was published after his death, right? I'm oh, sorry. Say that again. It was published after his death, right? So this doesn't. Yeah, I mean, contradict. it was published like forty years after his death. Yeah, yeah. So I'm fine with that. That that um, adheres to my after death the floodgates open principle. <laughs> but no, I I mean I do I do agree with you that like. Uh, our lives are just like this wash of so much mediocre language that like it doesn't it doesn't do a disservice to us to read some some lesser works of Nabokov I mean probably the lesser works of Nabokov are are brilliant and wonderful and definitely worth adding to the canon anyway Mm-hmm. Um, but but like I, yeah. to me it seems like so Nabokov like was too like he, you know he wrote this like in a hospital in Switzerland or something so like he was too mm-hmm. ill you know at, at the end of his life to actually like do what he wanted so what he wanted mm-hmm. was it to be destroyed but like mm-hmm. his relatives did not you know obey his dying wishes and did, so they did not destroy it so that's kind of like what we imagine Harper Lee's you know late in life wishes might be um mm-hmm. be, but we, we can't really know for sure because the situation is so strange but like so what if what if Harper Lee actually says changes her mind and says actually burn it? Like what should we do then? I don't think that anyone has an obligation to actually put Harper Lee's uh, work in the fire. So, <laughs> okay. so um, I'm just say um, uh, famously um, Nabokov threw uh, an early manuscript of Lolita in the fire and his wife rescued it. Oh, good for her. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. So. Yeah, the preservationist in me says, yes, you have to save the manuscript. Um, <laughs> but I do think I do think that it's fair, like as a compromise to dig the manuscript out of the fire, you know, uh, dry it off or get all the, you know, put out the fire and then put it in a safe for a while and, you know, sit on it until mm-hmm. it can't do harm anymore to the author. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess I just, I, I kind of see like at the end of someone's life, like, or you're just like on a death watch. <laughs> I mean, you know, like JD Salinger. <laughs> I guess so. Kind of, I know it sounds, it sounds really awful. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, JD Salinger was kind of a similar figure to, to Harper Lee in, in how they kind of lived the, their lives after, you know, their greatest publishing success. And he, mm. you know, he obviously died a couple of years ago and it, there was like rumors and there was this weird documentary that claimed it had evidence, but they didn't really seem to actually have the evidence. There were, rumor, there were rumors that there are a number of novels that J.D. Salinger wrote that he explicitly said you know, had to be published after his death. Uh, further things involving um, the Glass family and, mm-hmm. and other things that are like not novels, like nonfiction texts about about uh, Buddhism or something like that. Um mm. And like, so he, you know, he explicitly said, like, we have to wait. And like, we still haven't really heard. And, it's, you know, it's been three or four years since, since, since he died. But like, and, but he was like, kind of almost a, you know, notoriously like weird person and possibly mentally ill. <laughs> and, um, right. and he lived into his 90s. And so like, there are people who read Catcher in the Rye when it came out, and they are no longer alive. And maybe if there was, you know, if they read the glass stories. And they, yeah. you know, and J.D. Salinger, I laughed at him because he like was eating frozen peas every day or something and sure. living an aesthetic life up in up in New Hampshire. But like, you know, I, I just feel like the the 
those the interests of those people like should weigh in in some respects more than just the interests of the the single person who's the author who obviously created the works and you know their views d- deserve a lot of weight but i just don't feel like we we need to at the end of these people's lives like be waiting for them to expire so that we can read read their work i don't know yeah i don't know i i think i for uh, i do want to reserve a little bit of space for the author's intent and just honoring what he or she wants um the i i can see how it, it's a soft uh it's a soft line or a blurry line though mm-hmm. Okay, well, I mean, well, I guess we'll, we'll really see what happens. I, I really doubt there's too much money on the table. I feel like for them to. Oh yeah, no, to there's take, no way that the they're going to cancel it, and and that's also a reason why people are so suspicious of the lawyer because she's the executor um, of the estate, and she stands to make a ton of money from releasing this thing. So yeah, um, yeah. So I, so you know, I, I I'm making an argument purely on artistic lines, but obviously there's a crass commercial side to this mm-hmm. as well. That's probably weighs a lot more on the people, right. the publisher, and the this mysterious lawyer figure uh, mm-hmm. as well. Um, so why, why don't we move? Why don't we move to serial? So you okay. were were one of the co-hosts of a great podcast uh, that I th- was it called the Slate Spoiler Serial Spoiler yeah, Special. Yeah, the Slate Serial Spoiler Special. Um, right. So um, not for the week of tongue. <laughs> uh so you were an avid serial listener and i was really into it too and i i did uh a, a couple episodes on blogging heads about it and i actually got to interview uh rabia chowdhury after the series oh, wow. ended um yeah. and we'll, we'll we'll link to that um so a lot of like weird stuff has happened since serial ended like it's almost like more stuff has happened in like the six weeks since it ended than where yeah. ha- was happened during the 12 weeks that, that the show was on um so so well first I, I i couldn't i think where did you come down on on the central question of adnan's guilt like like in the end right so there's kind of like the metaphysical existential question which is like what what happened and did he do it and i think that's just like veiled in mystery forever like right. that sucks i wish it weren't but i don't mm-hmm. think we're ever going to know exactly what happened and whether he did it in terms yeah, so I, I, the, unless, unless there's DNA evidence, which seems unlikely at this point, it seems like we will never right. actually know what, what really happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there's the legal question of whether Adnan should be in jail. I'm like, definitely not. Definitely not enough evidence. But Okay, um, okay so what, we, yeah. we agree well, about but, that. Okay, okay, you're, you're on, on that boat as well. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, okay. I if I had to bet, I mean, it, I, I think I said um, I was around like 95% certain that he did not do it but i'm 100 mm-hmm. percent sure, certain that he should not have been convicted beyond a reasonable doubt like yeah it seems it seems very hard for me to understand how people can listen to the whole podcast and then not have at least a reasonable doubt mm-hmm. i completely agree with that and i know a lot of people said that sarah koenig was a biased narrator and that she allowed her own affection for adnan to color the reporting but i just thought you know she spoke to neutral third party. She spoke to um, high school friends and teachers and friends of Jay's, partisans of Jay's. It just, I definitely think that the majority of the evidence was inconclusive and did not point to him being the killer. So um, yeah, I I think a lot of the criticism of Sarah Kenny, I don't understand at all. I think she did really a masterful job. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's almost she, um, she set herself a really difficult task because in a way the more pleasurable and the more appealing and compelling she made the unfolding of the story uh the more likely people were to criticize her and to say you are creating art from someone's real life this is exploitative um this is wrong right um so she was sort of torn between creating um a, a good artistic product and um doing right by this kind of stodgy standard of like bland objective reporting um and i think what serial demonstrated so brilliantly is that that's a false dichotomy like you can do good reporting that is also incredibly gripping and narratively skilled yeah for sure and i don't know if you've you've seen this but i've seen uh, at least five different posts on places like reddit of people saying um i i thought it was fiction like i listened to the whole thing and i thought it was just it was just a really good story and then like i saw something yeah. online like oh my god this is real so i mean that's kind of bizarre but it shows how good yeah although like, it's strange the, the storytelling because, was 
it does make me think like would i have liked cereal if it was just like a charles dickens cereal story that it's unspooled week to week i think the illusion or i think knowing that it was real totally played into why i was so attracted to it um i don't know if you feel the same way yeah that's really interesting i mean so I mean, yeah, so it, it, the serialized, you know, this is the first time that like a nonfiction story like this has been told in a serialized way. And it was more like, you know, Charles Dickens who told his stories in a serialized fashion. But like, so if there was, if this was fiction and then um, we didn't find out who actually uh, killed Hay in the end, we'd all be mm -hmm. like, oh my God, we, we were ripped off. You know, it'd be like, they'd right. have lost, you know, people would be so pissed. But, um, but, you know, real life doesn't like neatly sort like that. And so, uh, but the other thing that's, that's different is like, so in, in fiction, the author decides who the murderer actually is. And right. the author thinks that like suspect A isn't as good an answer as suspect B, you know, they'll change it. And I don't know if you've ever read um, any of the uh, like, oh God, uh, sorry, um, Agatha Christie um, yeah, sure, mystery sure, novels. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually, I, I've only read two, but I read one, I read the most famous one, a murder on the Orient Express. It's like, Oh, this is really good. And you know, spoiler alert. Um, the, in that one, everyone is guilty. But then I read mm -hmm. another one and I was just like, wait, like it could be anyone. Like she, she just pulls it out of her hat who actually did it. And so yeah. the ending, like the mystery is kind of fun, but the ending is kind of like, well, how the hell was I supposed to realize that that was happening? And so, yeah, well, I but, think like the thing about Agatha Christie is creating like this incredibly internally cohesive Rube, like what's that word the rube goldberg machine so so mm -hmm. that like these elaborate schemes come to fruition and they couldn't have happened any other way even though they didn't happen at all um just that, that the rules of the world are so internally consistent that that um it feels inevitable I, right i mean okay. that's, i guess what yeah yeah so what I, I mean what i think about you know the mystery story in agatha christie is like it's not fair to the reader if like there's no way the reader could have figured it out from the clues and red herrings that are presented Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of feels like if you're reading a, a Sherlock Holmes or something and like there's no way you could figure out the mystery before Sherlock Holmes does. Like it's not mm -hmm. it's not an enjoyable mystery. But like mm -hmm. so this is different because something actually did happen. There is someone out there who actually did kill Haley and we're not quite sure who that person is. Um, and, and Sarah Canning was not able to establish who that person is. I think she showed pretty clearly that, that Adnan was not that person. Right. But, um, yeah, so I mean, it was kind of unsatisfying, but I think I thought it ended really well. So I want to, so has anything that's come out since, like the interview with Jay or the interview with the prosecuting attorney, Yurik, um, or the fact that Asia McLean wrote this um, this affidavit saying that she actually, uh, you know, she was t t will testify to the fact that she saw Adnan on the, the day in question. Like, has any of this, like, surprised you or, like, changed your opinion of anything that happened in the podcast? Um, not really. I think the one thing that just putting those three facts out there would have had the potential to change my mind would be if Jay had offered an incredibly incisive and consistent and plausible account of what actually happened and, you know, somehow had managed to resolve all the uncertainty around his very questionable character. <laughs> um, but instead, right. instead, I think the interviews just showed him to be a tale teller and a little bit unhinged. I, I don't know. I definitely come down very hard against Jay and I've I've gotten some flack from podcast listeners uh, for that. But to me, his interviews just sort of reinforced the the idea that I already had about him, which is that he is unreliable and sort of a, almost a compulsive weaver of stories. Um, and then the other yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He, he admitted he admitted that he perjured himself, you know, on the stand. Mm -hmm. You know, he gave a reason, which was like protecting his his grandmother. Right. Um, but you know, so he admit, you know, he admitted that he perjured himself, so that doesn't make him seem very sympathetic. Yeah, I don't understand these people who are like think like Jay is you know more or less a good guy who just like got mixed up in some bad circumstances. It, that doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Right. Um, um, so then, I want to. Sorry. Oh, go go ahead. ahead. No, no, no. Well, I have a crazy theory that I want to try out on you. But if you have anything else about things that have happened since Cyril ended. Um, uh, please share them. No, I would love to hear the crazy theory. Okay, so here's my crazy theory that doesn't, it's maybe like too clever by half and you can tell me if it's crazy, if, if it actually is crazy. Okay, so the theory would be uh, Adnan is completely innocent and had nothing to do with it and Jay is completely innocent and had nothing to do with it. And I think this kind of explains things that 
don't make any sense. Like, why is Jay lying so much? Why is he changing his story? Why can't he keep like basic facts straight? Um, so here's here's what you know. I don't even know if I believe this, but here's what could have happened. Okay. Okay. Uh, Hay Hay was killed by an, someone who Jay knew, um, okay. and I don't I don't know why. Maybe it was a drug deal. There's been stuff posted on Reddit about Jay's uh, a house where Jay lived was also the address of numerous people who were involved in the drug trade in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe Hay was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I, I don't know exactly you know, who could have done this. Um, and, and then it's just a coincidence that that Jay had Adnan's car and his cell phone. He mm -hmm. was not involved. Okay. Um, and they get this tip that, you know, someone calls in this tip. This is what happened. And we know that this happened um, saying, look at Adnan. So they get his cell phone records and then they see that, you know, their cell phone is calling all these people who Jay knows. And so they start interviewing these people. And I, if you, you can correct me if this is wrong, but I believe that's how they eventually got to Jay mm -hmm. um, through, through Jen. Um, yes. So then, so Jay knows who actually did it, but he was not even involved in the burial. Mm -hmm. um, but Jay can't snitch on who actually did it mm -hmm. because he's, his family members are involved in the drug game. And, you know, there's a stop snitching attitude in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but he, maybe he's doing something that day that, was illegal, like transporting drugs that, you know, transporting heroin or cocaine or something. Mm -hmm. um, so he decides that, you know, so, so the cops are looking at him, but he doesn't actually like know anything about it beyond maybe he like, here's some rumors about who did it. And so he concocts a story so that the cops, you know, will not like look any closer at right. who actually did it, will not look any closer at, you know, the drug, the drug stuff that he and or his family are involved in. And, and then he finger, fingers on on. And so the only thing that he, you know, the only thing that Jay knows is where Adnan's car is. Um, but he didn't even know that because when I talked to Rabia, she revealed that Jay first brought them to the wrong location huh, um, when he went to show them the car. Yeah. And then he brought them this, he brought them to the right location. So like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, that's just crazy. But mm -hmm. like, if you think that maybe Jay was just told where the car is, you know, by whoever actually did it. Then, then that's you can kind of interpret that fact in a way that makes more sense. Right. Okay. So that's basically, so that's basically okay. the theory. Does that is, is this totally I crazy? Mean, no, that that makes sense. I've heard really crazy theories too. One that was <laughs> that struck me as kind of plausible is like maybe Jay is working at his porn shop and that serial killer who had killed I guess one or two other Asian women I think um, I'm mm -hmm. forgetting his name uh, comes in and starts bragging about some girl that he <laughs> strangled um and jay is uh jealous of adnan because of the jen thing and um all of the or no i'm sorry stephanie um there was that there are questions about adnan's relationship with stephanie and so right. jay decides because to they frame, were they were you know king and queen of the junior prom or whatever right. and so jay decides to frame adnan um using information that he got from this serial killer i don't buy this at all, but it is just just to <laughs> level the playing field in terms of uh, spinning off crazy theories. Um, I think yours is probably less crazy than that. Um, okay, so it's not it's not the most crazy possible possible theory for what happened. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. It seems totally implausible, but at the same time, like, why is Jay lying so much, and why can't he keep his story straight? Mm -hmm. um, like, Internal even if if, yeah. if he, he wasn't, yeah, if he was involved, like, it seemed like he would like no more you know but if, if mm -hmm. we think that like maybe he's not involved at all mm -hmm. then he, and he's just a, a, but he actually is like a involved in drug in selling drugs and is like an inveterate liar right and we'll just you know the police ask him something they'll say oh yeah that's what happened and so that's why the story changes so much and then you know there's uh, uh there's been a lot of evidence shown that he, whether through explicit police coaching or kind of like implicit um hinting, you know, his statements change to match the cell phone mm -hmm. records mm -hmm. um, for, between the different statements. Yeah, so I don't know. I, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll put this out there, and, we'll, and I'm sure uh, there'll be a thousand people who will, will, will be able to disprove this, but yeah, call I don't know. Up, I call up it, the This American Life folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, if, if anyone from the Innocence Project is, uh, is watching this, you know, you can, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm free for, I'm available for interviews. Okay, so <laughs> is there anything else you want to you wanna say about Serial? Nope, I'm sad. I've actually, I've got to take off. Um, is that, is oh, that okay? okay? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, we will skip talking about uh, language and kosher and maybe take that up another time. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, yeah, Katie Wallman.
And uh, thanks to our viewers, and we'll see you again next time. Okay, bye.